Hello, everybody, and welcome to Geopolitical Trends. So excited to be with you on this weekend here. That's the second day of September. So where time goes, life goes by so fast. So anyway, I'm very excited to be here because I am going to be detailing to you today not only what just took place in Gabon regarding the coup, it's what was behind all this and really the big picture that nobody's talking about. There are a lot of moving parts, you know. That's why I always say, always try to see the big picture. So before I do all this, like I always do, because that's my way of saying thank you and expressing my sincere gratitude to all of you, and especially to those who decide to support this channel. So uh, speaking of the support of channel, we are, we are now at about 78 uh, uh, supporters and members. So like I promised you, once we reach 100 members, I am going to do uh, an exclusive Q&A and share one specific surprise for the members only. So uh, if you want to show your support, consider becoming a supporter or a member for the channel. And I truly, truly appreciate it. So and also, if this is your first time landing on this channel and I've been noticing some of you first time and they subscribed and I get the notification. Thank you so much for your support. So please subscribe if you have not done so already, and I truly appreciate it. So, uh, I have just a few announcements quickly here before I'll dive in into the topic. For the channels, uh, let me get my reading glasses here. I'm going to copy the link for the health channel. I know some of you have been asking me they couldn't find the name of the channel. Uh I don't, I don't know why, but it is there. I opened the channel. As a matter of fact, I am even considering changing the name. So I welcome your suggestions. If you have any suggestion for channel's name, I'd be happy to consider all that. So, so uh, what else I need to share with you? Yes, next week, you guys do not want to miss my interview with Dr. Ken Hammond. If you do not know who Dr. Hammond, then you need to check him out. Uh, uh, already arranged for uh, an interview. He's a historian, by the way. He's a Chinese historian specialist. So he's an American, of course, but his specialty is a Chinese history that goes way back to the 14th, between 14th, I think, 16th, and very, very fascinating guy. I can listen to him all day, and, and I know Ken for quite a while now. I consider him a friend. So I am going to already extend the invitation. He agreed he will be here next week. We're going to be talking about one thing that I need to focus on is the historical link from way back in South China Sea when it comes down to Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, and China. Yeah, we don't even understand those dynamics that took place back then. So Dr. Hammond is going to detail all that for us. So, uh, the other thing I want to announce to you guys is I will be launching a private government course. I will get the link for you and all that. Check it out if you're interested. I will be going behind the curtains, as we say, as one who works in Washington, we're not talking about classified stuff here because I can't, uh, you know, there are regulations and so forth, where I, which I have to adhere to, but I will not shy away from putting things on the table for you to understand really how our government function or does it. So if you're interested, I'm going to get a link for you uh, for if you want to uh, become a member for that uh, private course. And I'm also going to be doing more uh, appearances on locals and rumble. Yeah, you heard me because there are some issues I need to really explain openly. And I we can't do that here, sadly, uh, but I will be doing this and I will announce it to you uh, anytime I intend to do that because there are topics you need to know. I mean, I'm going to just tell you one on the top of my head right now. Why do you think this chaos that's going on around the world is this coincidence? You know, countries behaving in a way that we would never expect a government that's supposed to work for its people. No, nothing happens in a vacuum. And that's what I would like to be addressing on those platforms. So, all right, to today's topic. And, and from right off the bat, do you think the coup in Gabon was orchestrated by the U.S.? Now, just think before you say yes or no. Just try to think. And what I mean by this, guys, try to think about previous events that took place in the continent. I'll give you a hint. 
Libya. So, second question is, is the geopolitical landscape for Africa is changing forever? Because to me, that's how I read it. As an analyst, that's how I read it. This is why I had to get on last time. Uh, remember when I did about Indonesia, which, by the way, <clears throat> the Secretary of Defense in Indonesia just pushed back against a statement by the U.S. saying that Indonesia condemn uh, the war in Ukraine, which they never did. So somebody trying to reach me here and uh, I can't talk right now because I'm with you. So that is where the, the, so just to put things in perspective, and this is what I am going to be detailing today in, uh, in, in addressing this kind of issue. So, so here's the thing. <clears throat> of course, there have been so many coups recently, right? Uh, let me share a picture with you guys because you need to see. Uh, like I was picture, sometimes it helps in, in, in showing what are we talking about. So this is the leader of the coup. Uh, the, you can, again, call it revolution or call it a coup, whatever you feel comfortable with. So, But there is more than meets the eyes. Yeah, because that's how it is. When you consider, for example, how many uh, uh, military, you know, the term we use for now is coups, but how many events like this took place? You know, eight African military coups in three years. You know, that just speaks volume. Beside Niger, Burkina Faso, uh, Guinea, Chad, uh, you name it. So, but this highlights to us the idea of these changes all of a sudden is happening. Are African people waking up in those countries and say, enough of this? We want a government that works for us. We want what's good for us. Or is it something else? And this is why I said again. Uh, and again, I base these guys on my own research that I dig into in support of articles, which I will share with you. Uh, because there's one, one article by uh, 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 the name of Peter, Peter Cohen. I, I read this uh, incredible. It's part of the, uh, the global research uh, uh, think tank. Very interesting stuff. So. And, and rightly so, you asked these questions. Is there are more than meets the eyes when it comes down to uh, the coups in, 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 in Africa for now? So, before I delve deeper here, you need to know a little bit about the history and geography of Gabon. Let me share a picture with you guys. Uh, let's start with geography, shall we? Oh, hold on. Let me move this. Yeah, show this one. Here we go. Gabon. I'm going to leave this on for a little bit for you guys just to, as I uh, detail a few things, so you put things in perspective. So, so Gabon, you know, officially known as the Gabonese Republic. Uh, le, the name in French for us is La, Rep La République uh, uh, Gabonaise. So uh, its capital is Libreville. I do remember, this might surprise you guys. I remember when I was a kid, uh, his name was Omar Bongo, who happens to be the current president's dad, that guy served for about 42 years. Ah, it's problematic. So I, I don't believe in somebody serving that long. What can you do in 40 that you couldn't do in five? You know, that, that, that's to me, whatever, that's their country they can decide. So. so the country is on the west coast of Central Africa. So where are you looking at? Uh, uh, located on the equator, and it is bordered by Equatorial Guinea to the northwest, Cameroon to the north, the Republic of Congo on the east and the south, and the Gulf of Guinea to the west. So that's how interesting uh, uh, location for it. It's no different than when you when I put it on this map. You won't see it because it's written in small one. So this is why it makes, and I know you can see my, my cursor where it's going here, but I'm highlighting the whole area of the Sahel region. That's why it's so important. And this is why you have to put this within the context of like geography, of course, but also the historical one. So historically, and I am not going to go back to, uh, what, the 14th, I think, 14th, 14th century or so forth, when the discussion was about... Uh, 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 the Portuguese at that time, because that's how far back it goes. So the idea of, uh, because you have to put it within the context of Central Africa. 
So the arrival of the first Portuguese, yeah, it was in around the 14th Henry, 1470, 1472, some, somewhere around that time. So, And where they settled was in the southern part of Gabon. So, And that's why it was loosely, and I use this term specifically because that's how it is referred to in historical record. It was loosely connected to the state of Luango. So those who live in a region, they will know exactly what I'm talking about, which in turn was formed into a province of the vast Congo. Congo with the K, not a C, not a C, K, uh, the Congo Kingdom to the south. And rare, uh, right there from that area, from the offshore islands of the, uh, it's called the Sao, Tom, and Princip, where the Portuguese established sugar plantations and how that's how they developed the trade uh, with the mainland. Then you move fast forward, and I'm not going to cover all this. I'm going to move, move fa fast forward to the important era that pertain to our conversation here. Between, you're talking about 1839 and 1841, this is when France comes in. Because remember, it was the Portuguese, the Dutch, the Germans, the, the, and the French, and the, uh, the uh, British. This is why all the resources of Africa has been squandered, you know, the colonialism. You know, to me, I say, well, if those countries, those meaning in the West, wants to do the right thing, then return the stolen gold, the stolen diamond. I mean, you look at the British uh, monarchy. And again, I'm not criticizing, but it's a fact. All those diamonds you see the king or the queen put on this head, uh, whatever, where, where, where that diamond came from, you know, all the gold and all that belonged to India also, uh, Venezuela, you know, Africa. So if they want to do the right thing, like, for example, now uh, the current king, King Charles, if he really wants to go down in history as someone who did good, then return the stolen stuff to its proper or the rightful owner. So, so France, between 1839 and 41, established the protectorate over the coast. And in 49, 1849, that's when they uh, sort of uh, 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 they captured uh, the slaves, then they released them. But again, they captured them again. And that's when uh, the ship founded in Libreville, which is the current capital of Congo. Fast forward between 1860 to 1890, somewhere around that time, France ex expanded its control including interior of the state which means what taking over the resources you know and there, this leads to taking over the sovereignty this is a key for you to understand why am i saying this i'm saying this because that's exactly what we're seeing just in a different setting what's going on in australia now with the us establishing uh, uh the new uh, sort of this August thing. Speaking of August, while I'm thinking about it, you will be shocked to find out what just happened 72 hours in New Zealand. I already did a video. My editor is working on it, which I thank him for his continued support, and he works as fast with me, and so I extend my thanks to my editor. And once I get the video, I'm going to release the video. I am floored. Yeah, we all thought the foreign minister, Mahuta, Took, took stand, and she did, except now her boss threw her under the bus. What a shame. So, so I'm going to detail, and I intend to do a video on that one. So, so what do I mean by all this about the sovereignty to tie it to this? It's no different what France did back in the 1890s, around that time frame. So then after that, in 1910, now this is the turn of the century, but before I do this, you need to see one image that I had to uh, dig into the record and, and got a picture for you that you guys need to see. Uh, yeah, right here. Check this out, guys. This one, this picture here. This is a French Congo, as it was named back then. The natives, natives from Gabon. And this was the an image took in, took back, uh, was taken back in 1905 based on the record that I found. So, and this is why in 1910, Gabon became part of French Equatorial Africa. It was till until 1960 when Gabon got its independence from France. 
Yeah. Now you see why Africa, that, and again, this is the reason why I put that question at the beginning of my conversation here. Is the geopolitical landscape for Africa changing forever? It's because of that. So, so now when you talk about geography, when you talk about the political landscape, you can ignore talking about the economy. Now, we're not going to detail the ins and outs of it. Suffice it that I'm going to focus on two key things. Why? Because it will put things in perspective for you. Now, would you be, would you be surprised if I tell you that Gabon is one of the countries with rich economy and middle income. Yeah. Why is this? It's because the availability of raw minerals that includes iron. We're looking at uh, gold. We're looking at uranium. We're looking at manganese. And we're also considering oil. Yes. Because here is the thing, Gabon has massive amount of oil. So it's considered the fifth, listen carefully guys, is the fifth largest oil producing country in Africa since its discovery in 1931. What this coincide with, if anybody of you uh, follow history, 1931, it was the same time frame when the kingdom of Saudi Arabia was officially established, you know. And what did we do right after that? We sent the Conoco, I remember, the oil company that did for oil for the Saudis. And that's since, uh, it's been since that time, the deal was made between us and the Saudis, that oil for security. So what's interesting about Gabon that it joined the organization of petroleum exporting countries known as OPEC in 1975. Again, why is this important? It's because it was after 1971 when we took the gold, the dollar out of the gold standard, but it was right after that when we for, no, for and I won't use the term force, but we convinced, strongly convinced Saudis to use the petrodollar. So that's the time frame. So. However, there is the thing you need to know. Gabon withdrew from OPEC in 1995 due to the high annual fees imposed on members. And in 2016, Gabon rejoined again. So according to OPEC, and, and this is uh, the record from OPEC, Gabon possesses about 26 billion cubic meters of natural gas reserves at the end of 2021. Yeah. So oil and other liquid uh, liquids accounts for approximately almost 80%, 79% to be exact, of exports revenue. Well, if you have, just, just take a step back and think. If you have a country that exports 80% of its natural resources, how come the population is not benefiting from that? And by the way, this doesn't apply just to Gabon. Look at Iraq. You guys know how rich Iraq is in oil? And look at the living standard. Look at Libya. Look at Algeria. Look at uh, Sudan. Look at some other countries that they are producing. Or even you can go as far as Indonesia and Malaysia. They are not at the top producers of oil, but they have enough resources there. And yet the population is not benefiting from it. And what happened in 2022? Gabon increased its oil production uh, sort of uh, to about, uh, give or take, about 190 to 200,000 uh, barrel per day. Of course, that's not in major comparison to, for example, Saudis can cut it down by a million plus, if not more, uh, on, on a daily basis. So, But it doesn't matter. The whole point of this, to highlight this economic fact, is how a Gabon, a country that is rich, again, similar pattern. Its people are not benefiting from it. So, and this is why uh, a lot of people are wondering how come all of a sudden 
we got this uh, coup in Gabon that just happened this quick. You know, was it set up? Was it and, and funny enough that you don't hear much about, for example, uh, have you ever heard now since this uh, changes dynamics in Africa, anybody targeting the U.S.? No. France. Yes, because France has a lot of pressure, uh, has a lot of presence in Africa. But as an analyst, I have to think about it differently. I have to think about it in terms of could could be that we are throwing France under the bus. Let the, France takes the fall. No. Because when you think about it, there were many uh, 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 military coups in, in, in West Africa lately. And as I said, you look at, you know, Niger, Burkina Faso, Mali, and so forth. And all of this highlights the key that, ah, oh, is this has to do with the colonialism or it has to do with something else? You know, again, you just take, take a step back and think of countries like Mali, like Guinea, like Burkina Faso, Niger, Nigeria also, which is a former British colony that's had some issues too. You know, all of these coups, you know, it sort of gets, not all of them get a, enough attention equally, except for Niger. Makes you just wonder. So, and this is where I had a chance to read an article by Peter Cohen, which I'm going to, let me, let me get you guys the link uh, for the article so you can read it yourself when you have a chance to do so. Very fascinating article, uh, and it's somebody that's been uh, it's been spot on. I've been reading uh, some of his uh, analysis, and, and very very spot on. Okay, Hello. are we been? Uh... Yeah, here's the link, guys. You can you can read it later on if you feel like it. So the idea of thinking in terms of, uh, uh, well, this can't be, it has something, something's going on that is not clear, you know. And if France is saying, well, we're going to stand by, for example, Bezum in Niger, because he was put, you know, France had to play a role into that for the guy in Niger, you know. Well, guess what? It's no different than the guy in Gabon. I'm going to put a picture, but I'm going to share something. This is Ali Bango. Yeah, that's the deposed one. And he's the son of Omar Bango. Like I mentioned earlier, Omar Bango served for about 42 years in power. You know, but what's interesting about this guy? You know, it's the idea that there were some, uh, uh, like, like, as I said, for Niger, France was pushing to ensure that Bazoum stays in power. Why? Because he serves the, the serves the interest of France. I mean, you look at it literally. You look at it. Even even the monetary aspect. You know, France still taking over with the what they call the, the uh, Frank. It's called the African Financial Community or the uh, La Communauté Financière Africaine. This is the franc, the currency in Niger. So makes you just wonder why the guy, even the guy who just did the coup in, in Gabon, why was he speaking French to begin with? Why didn't he speak the local dialect if they are saying to get rid of France? So, and that's right there. You have to really take a step back and think. This might not be what it seems to be. And of course, this takes within the context of when Victoria Nolan won over in Niger, asking to meet with Bazoum, but she was turned down and kicked out. And, and her trip, I recall, it was on August 7th. So that is, she was snubbed, basically, you know, by the, uh, the new military leaders. So all this, you have to think of it in terms of what the media is saying 
versus what really happening. And that's why you might want to think about why we don't hear much about any 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 controversy towards the US, but it only geared towards France. So when you consider in both locations, in Niger mainly, but also in Gabon to a degree. So because more evidence now is emerging as to the uh, whether the coup, or you can call it a coup revolution, a coup in Niger, eh, the U.S. might have something to do with it. Could be the same with Gabon. They might have something to do with it. In the case of Niger, it's because we have two military bases in, in, in Niger. Yeah, let me share a picture with you. Because you guys, and, and I'm going to just share, by the way, one image here before I further details here about all the history of coups that's taking place in Africa. This is the entire continent, you know, from Algeria to, to uh, uh, Libya, of course, uh, you know, all of, mainly is going to be in this area here, which is the Sahel area. That's where, where you're going to see that one. But the idea of uh, the U.S. military presence, you know, because here's the thing. One of the bases is strategically important. And I did mention this before, guys, when it comes down to Niger. And it has to do with the drone base. And it's called the Agadez region. That's what it is. So it's known also for us in the military. You, you go by codes or something like that. Uh, the Air Base 20, uh, 201, Niger Air Base 201. And I found an image for, I'm going to share it with you. Picture two. So this shows the uh, takeoff of a C-130 from that particular location. Uh, of course, there will be no names. There will be nothing. It's just open areas. So that's a military transport. Usually that's where you put all the... Uh, you know, weapons, tanks, and so forth. So, so the bed, and that's taken off from Niger Air Base 201. You know. Then you have the second base in Africa. So, and this is why you're looking at between the US and France, both countries. You know, France still has about 1,000 to 1,500 military uh, personnel in Niger. And we all know what just happened two days ago when Niger asked the French ambassador to leave, but refused because citing diplomatic immunity, which is true. But guess what Niger did? They dropped that immunity. In other words, he doesn't have immunity anymore. So, and, and, and rightly, so it's their country. They can accept immunity from whomever they want, and they can take it out from whomever they want and ask whomever to, uh, they want to leave their country. So, and this is where it gets very, 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 very dicey to understand what's going on right now in Gabon. So, yeah, Niger is one story. Gabon is another. And why is this important? Is because you have to understand this picture here. Right here. This is during when Obama was in office. This is Ali Bango, his wife. Why is this important? It's because this guy, Ali Bango, plays a role, a major role when it comes down to the conflict in Libya. And we were the one uh, launching the one about Libya. That's why it's important for you to understand the role of uh, uh The role of Gabon into all this. And I did check from different sources as to really what's going on with that. And what I did found was that Omar Bongo was Obama's man in Africa. Yeah, surprising, huh? So, because before the removal of this guy, you know, sort of the... Uh, 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 the president of Gabon, Ali, as I mentioned, showed you on a picture. He was courted by and fed from Washington 
by the Obama administration at that time. So, and this is why it's very, and, and I'm going to send you guys a link so you guys can read it later on uh, to know where these things are coming from and why, why I have now to make it my mission to ensure that at least whatever I can cross, and if I am to share with you, I have to make sure if it is on the right path or it is misleading or misinforming, which I will have to warn you about. That's exactly what just happened with Indonesia. What prompted me to do that? Because there were articles there misleading. They were misleading, trying to pour Indonesia into a trap. That's the reason why. So this is no different here. And that's why you need to understand, uh, 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 because it was with the help of the Obama at that time when Ali Bango uh, sort of tried to portray himself as sort of a reformist and modernizer. Well, if you are modern uh, re reformist, why aren't, why, why aren't the, those reforms sort of translating to the average daily life of average Gabonese people or Gabonese, Gabonese citizen? It's no different than in Niger. It's no different than other countries. It's no different than us here in the United States. You get the corrupted politicians. You know, still holding power. You take like Mitch McConnell. I got nothing against the guy, but really he needs to. He can't talk anymore. Freezes because he's old, you know. But to show you how much power gets into their heads, and that's it. They will die holding on to power. Yeah. You know, well, with all this, how that translate to us here for every citizen? You know, I might be okay, but what about the other citizen who might not have the means? Who might be struggling just to find whether there is something to eat for dinner or not? And the damn politicians are just living this lavish style. That's why I said earlier, and the reason why I decided to to do my conversation, some of my conversations on the other platforms, because of this reality. You need to know and understand what is going on globally because that is so odd that countries are behaving irrationally i'm sure whatever part of the world you are watching me from your government you might notice something off a little bit that's the whole idea of all this so and here is the tank this reformist uh, bongo has traveled frequently to davos switzerland why? To attend the World Economic Forum. We all know what the World Economic Forum is all about. So, I mean, to give you a real example, look no further than that was taking place in Canada right now with the policies of the uh, dictator T. So, as a matter of fact, I do have one... one uh, Someone sent me uh, sent me a picture of. Uh, I don't know if I can find it here, guys, but I might not. But anyway, uh, the uh, the images of what's going on in uh, in Canada. Unbelievable. So now there is the other also the other thing that I need you to be aware of is to put this within that again the geopolitical because this is not a, just about uh, access to resources but also about who's going to define the new balance of power especially in africa and in southeast asia or or uh, uh, south china sea and the whole region there those two locations guys and there is a third one that i am now keeping an eye on just to see latin america the question is will latin america end up following the same pattern as it is in Africa. So I did a video for you guys about BRICS, the recent one. And I titled it one of the, 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 the things that I addressed was, who was the most beneficiary of the summit? And again, why this whole idea is to understand how the new, I'll use the term new, global balance of power is going to be shaped. Yeah, this one it will be a multipolar. 
gone if we are to think it's going to be bipolar. No, there is none. Because back then it was the Soviet Union. Of course, uh, Russia, today's economy, can be compared to that of China. So it will make more sense to be talking about if we are to argue that there will be a bipolar system, you're talking about China and the United States. But it's not the case. It's going to be a multipolar. Yeah, of course, Russia will still play a role into that due to its uh, uh, nuclear apparatus and military strength. Yes. But for when you look at China and put it under the microscope of the new global reality, this is where you're going to start to assess and say to yourself, okay, how this new global balance of power is going to sort of manifest itself. And we are seeing the changes, the dynamics that's taking place. I mean, you look at now, uh, I'm going to share this picture with you guys because you need to see it. And, and, and why it's really important to understand these dynamics between, uh, between other global powers like China, like Russia, and, and, and some African nations. Look at this picture here, guys. Okay. Let me see if, uh, yeah, you're seeing it. Okay. So this is the uh, 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 Omar Traore uh, meeting with the, the deputy minister of the defense of Russia, who is in Burkina Faso. So to me, it's writing on a wall right there. We all see what's coming. What's coming is, is that Russia is going to now support Burkina Faso militarily. Of course, Russia has enough uranium, doesn't need uranium from, from uh, Burkina Faso or Niger for that matter. But this is not about that. It is about the balance of power. And when you take, when you take or add China to the mix, you'll start asking yourself, you look at images of Africa for the last 30 years, what has Africa achieved with the presence of France or, or whatever country? versus what Africa has achieved now with the presence of China for the last 10 years. You start to see roads, you start to see bridges, you start to see upgrade airports, you get the idea. And that balance of power, it's going to be determined through these mechanisms. And this is why it's important to understand the idea that uh, how this is going to be now managed, if I may use the term, and managed by whom? Not just by us, but also how even the French themselves. So sort of what are the options? Because basically the way I look at it is now there is an anger in Africa. And France is like consuming all this anger. And rightly so. But also there is a stab in the back. That's why I said, are we stabbing France again? like we did in Australia. So this is what you guys need to really think through uh, before you, I'm sure you are not the type of individuals to just jump quickly to, oh, it says this, it must be that. No, no, you're smart. You can think through. You can think through. And I'm here at least to help on my capacity uh, to uh, break down uh, the, the information to the basic level so that everybody can have an understanding. It's because there is something going on on the global stage by design. All this, it's not happening in a vacuum. And you need to be aware of and understand. Because if you think, oh, this doesn't impact me, you're mistaken. You are mistaken. So, so this is what I believe uh, uh, my whole reason for why I decided to uh, come over on the air here and share this with you because I need you to understand those dynamics. The media is not going to disclose it. They is not going to explain it because that's how it is. It's almost similar to what we're seeing right now, for example, in Canada, which, by the way, because I was in Canada just about a month ago or so, uh, and, and, and changed I lived in Canada back in the 80s for, for a short period. Uh, to me, Canada's gone. And yet you're seeing now the number of homeless. You're seeing the number of people struggling. 
and all their prime minister is saying, oh, we're going to have to help Canadians. No, 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 no. Because the prime minister there is pushing an agenda that is dictated by outside entities. So it behoves Canadians now to decide who they want in office. So I'm not Canadian. I can't vote. I don't, I can't say uh, that's their decision. That's their decision. So. so for now, suffice it to understand, guys, what's going on in Gabon is just part of a much bigger puzzle you need to understand. So, oh, Mini Rick, thank you so much. You wrote. Thank you very much for your hard work. It's really, yeah, you're, you're most welcome. And, and, and I'll tell you guys straightforward because I don't sugarcoat them. It really consumes my day to go through the information to ensure at least what you are hearing from me is accurate. I will never, ever tell you what it's, I'm not sure of. I will never, ever tell you what you want to hear. And I will never, ever lie to you. Because that doesn't exist in my vocabulary. If I don't know something, I'll say, I don't know, I will get you the answer. And if I know, I have to check. So yes, it does take me time now to manage more than one channel. It's time consuming, but it's worth it because I ask myself, what am I doing here? I am sure you have to ask yourself that question. You may have asked yourself before, and if you haven't, it is time to ask yourself. What are you doing here? What are you really doing here on this earth? I mean it. You can be going, you know, I care for you because you are part of this community. And again, I don't say it to be Mr. Nice. I don't know you that well, but I won't. I won't sugarcoat things. But you have to really ask yourself that question because you can be going through uh, noise, meaning having a hollow existence. You're better than that. You are better than that. Oh, Moni, thank you so much. Rick, thank you so much for your super sticker. Truly appreciate it, man. Much appreciated. So, because as I said, you have to ask yourself that question. Otherwise, what kind of existence are you living on, man? Come on. You know, and these questions, believe it or not, are uncomfortable. Many, you know, I'm not a psychologist, but I read enough and talked enough to people in the field Tell me how much manipulation goes with oneself to avoid asking those hard questions. Why? Because those hard questions makes you look inward. You look at your own self, a reflection of yourself. What am I doing here? But trust me, you're going to have a challenge at the beginning asking yourself, but it's going to become clear to you. What are you doing here? And you'll be in much uh, at, at a... A better place you'll be you'll have peace with yourself in understanding what is your role here so i'm i'm very convinced i feel comfortable with this that's why anytime i come over i'm excited to be here because that time is worth it and because of course you if it was a different community uh i probably won't be here or i will put the dots on the letter as we say and and ask the uh you know, just to make, to make sure. So that is the whole reason why I'm doing what I'm doing now. And I wanted to make sure because there's a lot of stuff going on. Even from academia, even from entities, think tanks, you know, manipulation. Here I am. I did the video for you guys about New Zealand. You're going to remember, right? And we all will agree because I was with you on that. Till I found that 72 hours. What just took place in, in New Zealand? Oh, my gosh. How that happened? But to me, it gives me the idea that beside Africa, it's the part of the world that is going to now determine the new balance of power. And again, I did the video. Be on the lookout for that video, guys. So, All right. Let me take. Uh, and again, uh, just to remind you guys, once we reach 100 members for the channel, I am going to do. Uh, oh, Tracy Gavin, good to see you. Tracy Gavin, by the way, just became a channel uh, uh, member yesterday or the day before, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you very much, Tracy. Tr truly appreciate it. So, and, and all the other members that have been with me since the beginning of this channel here. So I can't thank you enough, guys. 
Uh, yeah, Ibrahim Traore, you're absolutely correct. Uh, so, as I said, be on the lookout, and uh, I will be releasing those kind of videos for you. I, will in I intend to do a live stream on the New Zealand, because you need to know what's coming. But I'll wait till you see the video, because I always like you guys to have a background understanding. Then I'll elaborate more. Now, of course, I can't cram everything in one video. And I already decided to do short videos uh, to the point. Then we'll do the live if uh, we are. Uh, if you guys want it, of course, I'm not going to just do this unless you want it. So. All right, guys. I hope you find this very informative. And I look forward to seeing you next time. As always, remember, geopolitics impacts your daily life in more ways than one. Till next time. Bye-bye.